actually get a special um, award that is um, printed by the Fab Lab uh, La Catiere in Costa Rica. And this is a 3D printed uh, award. It comes out and it mounts on this little channel. It has flashing lights. We have a great video of it being manufactured. And uh, these have already been sent by mail to Petrina Law and Jenrin Wetzler and Mahabali and Yasser Tamer in Egypt. And since Delmar is here, we thought maybe he could take it back for his students and put it up in the office of Libertex. Um, but with that, we really want to honor um, Libertex students, Henry Agnew, Ethan Turner, and Matthew Barkovich, who have done amazing work to support, which Delmar is going to be here to talk about. Would you like to come up, Delmar? Yes. Check this out. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. I don't think you have slides, but you're going to no, just no, go to talk. Okay, yeah. perfect. So Alan promised me 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so chapter one, verse one. Uh, so uh, I'm up here. Thank you very much for this. We got two awards last year. I didn't get a single one, so I get to keep this uh, and send them photographs of this and they get to, to take a look at that. Um, I guess I have to put it together, so that's going to be fun. So I'm up here presenting again for uh, three former undergraduate students that have contributed critical roles to the building of the Libertex project and to the organization that it is today. <clears throat> Approximately 7,000 students, just as a context, have contributed to the Libertex project, largely uh, as part of open pedagogy projects in classrooms. Some of them are as volunteers, and some of them are as employees uh, of our project, uh, supported by uh, multiple grants. Um, <clears throat> But these three, Bart Bar Matt Barkovich, uh, Henry Agnew, and Ethan Turner stood out uh, especially for their impact in building the Libra text, uh, and especially in particular focusing on the state of technologies of the Libraverse, which is the, uh, the set of technologies uh, underlying the Libra text. So let me talk about each of them um, uh, in turn. Matt Barkovich. Um, worked for us uh, from March 2008 to uh, September 2008. We consider March 2008 to be our birthday, so we are about 15 and a half years old. Uh, and it started as an open pedagogy project, then called the ChemWiki, that I was using in multiple classrooms. Uh, Matt was taking one of the classes, uh, and at that time, we were using a learning management system called Sakai, and specifically its wiki-based technology, because we knew we wanted to base our stuff off of wikis. Um, and that turned out to be a very painful experience, if anyone has ever used that specific technology off of there. And even the Sakai people admitted it's a painful uh, experience. After I implemented this infrastructure, Matt came up to me after class one day and, and basically told me that what I was doing was wrong uh, and, and then said that he could do something better. Uh, and uh, he threw the gauntlet down and I picked it up and said, yes, please. Uh, and he did. He built his own, he built the server, the first server that hosted the uh, ChemWiki. It was in the corner of my laser laboratory uh, and it was operating as the primary technology for the LibreTex up until 2013. That means he set it up, set the operating system, found the technology that we use based off of MindTouch um, and <coughs> and approach those things. Uh, and that was exceedingly critical. Uh, he is now an assistant professor of radiology at the University of California, um, San Francisco campus. Henry Agnew um, joined the Libertex project in uh, June 2016 as a high school student, uh, a local student in Sacramento, California. Um, he then transitioned uh, as an undergraduate student uh, and worked the entire four years, actually five years, because he took an additional year uh, in order to just work on the Libertex as, as its own, uh, and then is now pursuing a PhD at the University of, Southern, uh, University of California, San Diego, in chemistry. His contributions to the Libraverse is extensive. Uh, in he, there are a few parts of the infrastructure that doesn't have his fingerprints on it at various levels. He built the Remixer, uh, which, uh, which received the OE Global Excellence Award last year, which I did not get an award. I'm going to point that out. <laughs> um, uh, he built our infrastructure for generating print physical books, which I have several copies of them out uh, in the booth that I am hosting out there. Uh, he built our first version of a single sign-on infrastructure. He built a molecular builder infrastructure uh, uh, system for building uh, biochemical kinetics uh, and a wide range of other tools. And he did this all as an undergraduate student. Uh, it was impressive. 
Ethan Turner, <coughs> the last of the three, started in 2020 uh, as a harvester, which is our term and our mean taking existing OER and bring it into our platform, whether it happens to be textbooks, worksheets, or homework as part of our ADAPT infrastructure. He focused primarily on computer science uh, text and focused uh, uh, specifically on Jupyter enabled, which means that he has the ability to embed executable code into the textbook, um, and he was pursuing textbooks of the future. Uh, about a year after he started, he came up to me and, and said I was again doing something wrong. Uh, <laughs> see a theme going on here. <clears throat> uh, and he introduced as a side project something he built, uh, which we now refer to as the Commons and Conductor, which is our portal to the Libreverse. It was a project management tool, and the key point is that we had so many projects going on, not just the ones that we were uh, facilitating on our, on our campus, but many other campuses out there, and that we needed to have an, an OER-centered project management tool. And he built it for me and said, here it is. And my response was, wow. And then we started to build and expand it. And now it's an exceedingly powerful infrastructure and a key component of the Libreverse. Um, he built our single sign-on, our new single sign-on system that we call Libre One, uh, which has been exceedingly powerful. He's extended, he's not uh, at any of the UCs. He's now uh, working um, partially at Libre Text and partially in his secondary company. Um, but I can say without any reservations, if it weren't for these three Fac not, not faculty, students, <clears throat> then students, uh, we wouldn't be anywhere near we are today because I'm a chemist by training uh, and I needed to learn these things very slowly and they introduced me to the potential that I was able to put out there. So um, we wouldn't have reached uh, building an infrastructure that uh, reaches 1.1 1, 1 .1 billion page views since we started back in 2008 when Mart Matt came up to me and told me I was initially doing something wrong. With that, I thank you very much, uh, and I'm sure they're going to be appreciative of the photograph of their award. That they're coming there. So with that, thank you very much. Right, so. Thank you, Delmar. And, and you know, we, we talk a lot about like student pedagogy of actually students contributing. Uh, it's actually the whole platform is, is definitely a powerful thing that we want to appreciate about LibreText. Next up, we're going to learn all about a great project that uh, Modern Humanities on Manifold. Uh, Manifold's a fantastic platform, but this is probably an incredible implementation of it. And I want to welcome up here Paul Riccardi and Michelle Turnbull, who are going to really thrill you with everything that they've done with this course. Thank you, Alan. We just learned a new word, harvesting. Harvesting. Yeah, oh wait, we have to go there. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much to Open Education Global for having us. Uh, we are so honored to receive the Open Reuse Remix Award and to be among uh, such extraordinary uh, creators. We're really humbled to be here today. And today we're just gonna show you um, our OER Humanities text that we created and walk you through our collaborative process. So uh, that's me, I'm Paul <laughs> Ricciardi. I'm uh, on the theater arts faculty at Kingsborough Community College, which is a campus at the City University of New York. And I'm also a co-coordinator for the humanities course, which uh, our OER uh, lives with, uh, which is part of College Now, an early college program at Kingsborough Community College. And I'm Michelle Turnbull, and I've taught this uh, College Now humanities course for many years before I started coordinating the course with Paul at Kingsborough. So uh, we're very lucky to be at Kingsborough Community College. Kingsborough's support for the development and the creation of OER text is something that should be acknowledged and admired, starting with Erica De La Cruz, the director of the College Now program. Um, and you know, Kingsborough has o OER coordinators who do like the research for the grants and who really encourage faculty to apply for them, which is amazing to be in such a space. So we definitely want to thank Shauna Brandle and Ryan McKinney for all their help getting us the grant money to continue to work on this project. We also really want to thank Robin Miller, who is an open educational technologist and who is here with us today hey, in person. She came to cheer us on. Uh, before her, our text was just a PDF. Uh, it certainly would not have been in Manifold without her help, and it really wouldn't have those really nice next page buttons that you'll see, because YAML files, am I right? <laughs> um, this was truly a collaboration, as you'll see is the theme of our presentation. Uh, when you download our text, it's nearly 300 pages. That's a lot of OER text. We could not have done that, just the two of us. So we really relied on teachers 
who were teaching the content from all across New York City, teachers of many different disciplines. We have special education teachers, English teachers, music teachers, art teachers working on this text. So I just want to give them a quick shout out. Matthew Foreman, Andrew Wilder, Monica Walker, Shannon McArdle, Maria Rosario, Donna Ryan, and Matthew Hoffman. Thank you, truly. And now we know that they're harvesters. That's what we, <laughs> yes. they're harvesters. Uh, so just a little bit about our process in creating uh, the Humanities OER. Uh, so um, first of all, just a little bit about college now. So Kingsborough Community College, which is part of the City University of New York, there are multiple uh, CUNY or City University of New York campuses that have this College Now program, which in short is an early college program where the uh, colleges provide college courses at high schools throughout the city. Uh, so the College Now program um, that is run by Kingsboro, we have uh, college courses at high schools throughout Brooklyn and Staten Island, and Michelle and I have been coordinating this humanities course. When uh, COVID hit, um, we could no longer get our students the, the you know, 10 pound, $300 textbook to their homes. And, you know, honestly, and we're kind of embarrassed, we, you know, we'd heard like, oh, OER, it's free. Let's, let's get one. <laughs> and then we quickly found out it didn't work like that. And I, we were so grateful to hear in, in the keynote the question about, you know, cost savings. And what we quickly learned is it's not about cost savings, it's about accessibility. And that's what uh, we learned very quickly about this text. So with the support of uh, the OER coordinators on our campus, we got some grant money and began the endeavor of creating a new uh, text that was a collection of all sorts of uh, resources. Um, the Humanities course is a course in which um, we help students contextualize the humanities in our culture. So there are all sorts of chapters exploring visual art, theater, music, poetry, all of it. Um, the way we came about creating our OER was to engage the faculty teaching the humanities courses in the high schools throughout Brooklyn and Staten Island. And we all worked together and harvested resources, I'm just gonna say harvest as many times as possible now, <laughs> harvested uh, these resources that became the sort of uh, humanities readers. Um, and we all worked together. It was a very collaborative um, um, sort of working environment. And we each took a section of a chapter. Uh, Michelle and I oversaw the whole thing and brought it to fruition. Uh, we assigned faculty certain parts of the chapter. We all harvested. Uh, we then came together and put this into what became a PDF. Uh, we, uh, Michelle and I spent a very long summer double checking all their citations, making sure they actually were open, learned a lot more about OER. Uh, we then met uh, Robin Miller, <laughs> who helped us take this from a PDF to something that is truly, truly dynamic and interactive, which we'll show you in a bit. Um, uh, the final uh, piece uh, so far is that in a last uh, grant cycle, we then worked with faculty to create resources for these chapters. So there are videos and PowerPoints lesson and lesson plans um, that uh, students and faculty can click on that are become companions to the reader itself. So this map I love, although it's not a billion downloads. I was feeling really <laughs> good about my map. <laughs> um, I love this map because OER by nature acknowledges that education is about sharing ideas and resources and should be open. And this illustrates the impact, the influence that just one text can have. It's been downloaded over a thousand times in all these different countries and we're really proud of that. Or I was. <laughs> <laughs> And now we'll show you what the text looks like. Um, so we did a little video screen. So this is our landing page. Okay, you can see we just have a course description followed by the titles of all of our, um, the content that's in there. So you can see it covers history, music, architecture, poetry, drama, theater, um, a little bit of everything as in, is the nature of the humanities. Um, so we're really proud of that. And then as you scroll down, you get to all the resource collections that go with each chapter. And there were 93 total resources um, that we put together. So this is just a sample chapter. This is chapter one. 
Um, and then something that we implemented uh, soon into our project was uh, a resource called Things to Consider, and this is for both faculty and students. So they're, you know, I guess you could call them study guide questions, you know, questions that you might want to consider as you dive into the chapter and the unit. Um, and we wanted, you know, this is being, you know, this is a, a reader for the students and the faculty. So these things to consider are speaking to both um, the folks that are teaching the courses and otherwise. All right, so are we going to annotating mm -hmm. now? So one of the beautiful things about Manifold is how the students can interact with the text. You can highlight a section, you can have students highlight in reading groups. You can highlight a section and pose a question to the students. The students can share their thoughts or reactions to the text, and in this way, they're interacting with the text in a new and interesting way. So one of the things we love, so I wanna go back mm -hmm. just for a second. Um, one of the things we love is that uh, the resources, the way people interact with resources within the chapter there's a little, uh, see that little square at the top? You see that, you click on it, and you know, oh, this has some sort of companion to the thing that I'm reading. And we love this because we think that this is how our students learn, right? We live in a digital culture where if you can't get something in one click, you're, you know, you've, you're lost. And so within one click, our students can, you know, see a PowerPoint or a video. And what's really important about this is uh, so, for example, the Museum of Modern Art, a lot of artwork is not open, but news clips or videos of the art is, and so many of our students don't have access to MoMA. Uh, you know, they live in southern Brooklyn, they're just not going to get out there, so these videos are creating access. So we love the resources. Now I have to keep skipping <laughs> to next steps, is that where I'm going? Yes, okay, right. hold on, we're going, we're still going. I'm still going. It looks so nice, doesn't it? I know. <laughs> this is when we thought we had an hour. No, okay. So, um, so I mean, that's, that's just a little bit about our resource. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, right now our reader has four very large chapters. We want to add a fifth um, chapter that deals with modern issues. You know, so for example, is what's happened to the humanities and art in our you know, post-COVID environment. One of the things that we love about this reader is it's not, it's, it's, it's fluid, so you know, because we're working with faculty members all the time, they ask for things and say, oh, we need more in the punk movement from the 70s. Okay, great, we can do that. You know, we really need more it's on modernist, you know, poetry, modernist poetry, let's <laughs> add it. So we can, this, this is not a set thing. It, it will move and change forever. Um, we also want to add uh, a companion where we start harvesting. Um, samples of student work that has been generated from our humanities course and from other folks adapting this reader from around the world. This way you can see what can be done through the text yeah. and what can come out of it. And tell them about the wine. So we have a faculty member. So the humanities faculty, uh, one of the qualifications is that you have to have a background in the humanities. So our faculty, are, many of them are theater artists, our musicians, our visual artists. And we have one uh, high school art teacher who has a background in, in the visual arts and painting. And so for her unit on the late 60s, she had the students create protest posters. Um, it was just a really interesting example of connecting the students and getting them to understand how the humanities and visual art uh, impacts our world. And then finally, this is sort of one new step, you know, um, maybe it was over a glass of wine last night where Michelle and I decided we want to, we want to share um, th this OER and we're planning on writing an article um, so other folks can do what we're doing with the humanities text. So we're really excited about that. So we leave you with this beautiful picture of our Kingsboro campus. Um, that Paul took, yay. And we just wanna thank you again for this honor. We are humbled to be included with so many amazing people and this amazing organization that acknowledges, supports, and promotes the belief that education should be open. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, that was tremendous. I hope everybody is checking this out right now. Um, but now we have something really exciting. This may be one of the most favorite, I love a good title. And I heard about
buds, bark, branches, and bark a couple years ago. And the story of what Julia has done in terms of where she got the idea, and she's going to tell this, and where it's going, you'll, you're going to know right away why this won this award. So we welcome Julia Lords Tomlin, who's coming to us from the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And she came out specifically to be part of this presentation. So thank you. I just want to say I'm super grateful to be here. It's amazing to be among so many other uh, inspirational educators. And yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to speak to you a bit about um, my journey as an educator and um, how I got involved with open education resources. So uh, actually, my very first time hearing about open education was BCIT sent out an email um, asking people to apply for grants. And I had never heard of open education uh, resources at that point. I had just started working at BCIT, and I thought, oh, that looks like a cool grant. I'll just throw my name in the hat. And um, stunning to me, I got approved to create a, a card game called uh, Plant Press. So this was my very first OER, and it kind of helped get me in the swing of things. So we um, worked together with the students to uh, create some kind of like puns and uh, art for helping people uh, learn different names of plants and how to identify them. So that was my dipping the toe in the open education resource world. And um, yeah, because of that work that I did, it inspired other uh, people in my department to learn a bit more about what OER was. I could share that with them. And uh, another faculty member who I worked with uh, decided to create a series of open education videos called Interviews with Plants. So yeah, I got to be involved in that project too. Uh, so we got what the idea is we go outside and uh, basically we talk to a plant about how to identify that plant and what are some of the key features. So uh, yeah, those are the two kind of OERs that sort of helped uh, inspire me on my journey to create an open education uh, textbook. Um, so yeah, basically uh, I'm also a student when I, uh, from BCIT, I was uh, a student in the forestry program, I got my diploma, and then I went on and I did my ecological restoration degree at BCIT as well, and then I worked for a few years and came back as faculty. Um, but one of the things I noticed uh, during my time as a student is that when we were trying to learn the plants, it was winter. And it, that was unfortunate. <laughs> so the resources we had um, just weren't very adequate for that time of year. And that's just the time of year that school happens, right? Fall and winter. Um, so as a student, I was, I was really wishing there was some kind of resource that would help me and my classmates uh, learn to identify plants in the winter. So that was sort of the very uh, beginning of this idea was from when I was a student and wished there had been a resource. So that was... Uh, way back in 2007, the seed was planted. Um, yeah, and then, like I said, I mentioned I, I applied for open education grants through BCIT, and that was how I first learned about OERs. Uh, and in 2019, I applied for another grant to work on creating that uh, winter identification textbook. Um, so yeah, we started it in January 2020, and as you know, some stuff happened that year that kind of disrupted everything. <laughs> But we worked together, me and the students remotely, to kind of pull together our first attempts at the book. Um, and then over the next uh, three years, I worked with many different groups of students. And I started to sort of talk about what we were doing at the Institute. And the more people I talked to, the more kind of inspired and excited people were. Like every time I talked to people about what we were doing, people were like, yeah. I want to be part of your thing. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Because um, although I sometimes think that I'm sort of like the captain of this ship, of this project, uh, there's no way I could do it without all of the amazing people that work together with me on this. Um, if it was just me, it would be three pages long <laughs> and uh, probably in PowerPoint or something that didn't look that nice. So I'm super grateful for all of the work that was put in together over the years by the many students. And I'll show you a little bit of the evolution of the book over time. Um, so yeah, now we're into 2023 and onwards, and I'll talk a little bit about what my vision is for the future. But like I said, the thing about this project is it just seems like people want it to keep going and going. So I think it could keep going as long as I want it to be involved, and maybe someone else would want to take it over at some point too. But it's been a real... Um, a real wonderful journey, and I, I think it's 
probably the most fun thing I've done in, uh, during my time as an instructor. So I'm super grateful to have worked with so many awesome people. Um, speaking on that, uh, so at BCIT we have different schools. We have the School of Construction and Environment, which is my school. Uh, we also have the School of Business and Design. Uh, we have the School of Transportation. We have the School of Nursing. So we have many different schools. And when people ask me uh, where I work, I say, I work at BCIT. And they say, oh, cool. Do you know my friend? They work at BCIT. And I'm like, no, probably not if they don't work in the department that I work in. Um, and that's the thing I think that happens a lot, a lot of post-secondaries is we end up being very siloed, right? We, we're working with only a handful of people, and all these other people are doing all these cool things, and you have no idea <laughs> until you start to reach out. And I think that was one of the things I found the most amazing about this project, is I got to work with people in many different schools across the institute. And uh, right now, we've had about 200 collaborators working on this project when we bring in if we think of all the students that have worked on it and all the faculty and even some outside people as well. So yeah, it's been an honor to work across and kind of break down some of those uh, barriers at the Institute. Whoops, go back here. Oh, hitting the wrong button. Um, so <laughs> as I said, in the year 2000 was when we, or excuse me, 2020, I'm time traveling. Um, <laughs> In 2020, we did our first version of the book, and at this time, I didn't really know what it meant to make a book. I was like, pick whatever format you want, any file type, don't even worry about it. And that was a bit of a mistake, but you know, <laughs> it's a learning process, so this was my first attempt. <laughs> yeah, I was admiring how beautiful your book layout is. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we started with just anyone do whatever you want. The idea was that people were supposed to go out and kind of uh, pick a plant and go out and, and be with that plant, take pictures of it. Um, but because we were so disrupted uh, with our learning at that time, uh, people ended up doing kind of a more online version of um, the book. So it was like they went out and researched about the plant online rather than going out and being with the plant, which was what was originally intended. And like I said, I had tons of different file types, so it was a bit of a disaster for me to pull anything together. Um, but yeah, the next year we worked together to kind of pull together an actual template. Um, so we had a template that people could put their stuff into. We could all work on it at the same time, which was nice. And uh, that was kind of the first edition that we released. So that was uh, spring 2021. And uh, you can see there's still some big um, blanks in this. So. Uh, this is big leaf maple, and that's, this is kind of the, how it evolved over time. So we're missing some of the information, some of the photos are so-so, um, but you know, we worked together, and then the next year we were able to bring in more information. So basically this was like I would go to my students, ask them what plant they were interested in, they would pick a plant, and then we would kind of continue to build year after year a kind of a library of information about that plant and photos. And I asked them to use their own observations too. So what, what made sense to them when they were describing the plant? Um, so yeah, we ended up coming up with something that was much more usable um, and kind of a better layout. And then the following year, um, I, I presented a, a talk at BCIT and I met someone who worked in the School of Business um, doing, um, teaching Adobe Illustrator and um, the other Adobe products. And she was like, my students could make a way better looking book for you. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> so I met with the students and they came up with many different designs. So this is me with uh, the graphic art students and they had come up with a bunch of different uh, style guides, which I didn't know was a thing. And they had picked colors and stuff and it was very exciting to work with them. So we worked, uh, we picked one uh, um, template that was uh, set forward and then the whole class worked together to bring the book into that format. And here's the book after they worked on it. So it's <laughs> a significant upgrade, I would say. Um, they worked really hard to have a lot of hyperlinks too. So the table of contents, you can hyperlink back and forth out of each plant. Um, there's also links to some of our interviews with plants uh, website, or excuse me, our interviews with plants uh, YouTube videos are in there. Um, yeah, so just a much more improved layout to the book. Um, and now it's, that's available in PDF format. And yeah, it was, it's just been a real amazing process to see the evolution of how things changed over time. Um, and then, so uh, in year four, 
I started working with a, a professional editor, stu in a, a, a student professional editor who was taking professional editing, and I learned about uh, style guides for writing, which again, I also didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> so we worked together to edit um, the, all the entries, because when you have hundreds of authors, um, it gets a little messy at some times, and I was super grateful to work with her. And one of the things we also did was we tried to um, have more respectful language about plants in the book. So for example, when we talk about plants in the book, we don't call them it. Um, we use they or we just rewrite the sentence so there's never like it has this or it looks like that. So we've taken out some of that kind of la colonial language around plants. Um, it's just a small thing, but I think it does make a difference when you read through the book. Um, I also worked with a group of students to create plant maps so you could go out and see where these plants were. And that was really cool too. Uh, these students actually worked on, in their own free time to do these maps, so that was an amazing collaboration as well. And I also learned how to take better pictures of plants, so that was my journey as well. I became a bit of a, um, a twig photographer, I call myself. So <laughs> um, when people are like, oh, you're into photography, I'm like, just twigs, just twigs. Uh, but yeah, so that was, um, that was a fun part of a kind of revamping the book and uh, upgrading it significantly. And yeah, so we're at the point now where um, the, the third edition of the PDF is going to be coming out soon. Uh, so again, that will be interactive. It'll have those plant maps in it. We're adding 28 more plants uh, to the book. And um, so that's kind of, uh, in the next month or two, I should be able to share that interactive third edition. It's available as Google Slides right now, but uh, it's not, it's uh, the old format. It's not that nice new layout. And I've been trying to find a way to get it printed um, because people keep being like, we need a field version of this to have out in the field. And I'm like, just put it on your phone. But people really want a printed copy and I've been trying to find a way for that, but it hasn't, uh, it hasn't been t totally going super well. So <laughs> I'll see, I'm still working on that, trying to reach out to different people. It's a little bit hard with OERs, as you know, sometimes to find a way forward for, uh, for printing, especially something like this. It's like high color or high resolution photos and stuff. So I don't know, so I'm working on that. And um, yeah, I've, I, when I presented at BCIT, there was also a group of students from another program who were really st uh, excited about the opportunity of turning this into an app. And I was like, oh wow, I never even thought about that. So anyways, I think there's some, uh, still some traction here. Lots of people are excited, sort of snowballed. The more people who are involved, the more people want to be involved. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful to uh, have been uh, part of this and to be the captain of a, <laughs> of a ship that seems to be sailing really well. So. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here today and letting me share a bit more about my project with you. Thank you so much, Julia. You can see a lot of energy there and, and what an arc of growth for a project. Um, maybe she'll talk to the manifold people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we like to have here. So uh, next up we have in the Open Policy Award winner, Byung Che is here about to us this fantastic thing that has happened in Washington. Um, and again, we have a theme here of being student driven and this is very exciting. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm deeply honored to receive this award on behalf of 34 Community and Technical Colleges of Washington. This is such a meaningful gift, especially to our system colleges student association who turned this seemingly impossible idea into a reality. So first of all, just a quick overview of what it, what it is. Um, Washington State has two state policies that require all of our colleges to label the courses that use OER or low cost materials. They appear on the class search page, as you can see there, um, enabling our students to make more informed choices at the time of registration. So the idea is really simple, isn't it? Like, you know, you label the courses that use OER and make them show up on the class search page so students can filter and make good choice. And then, um, but our road to get here uh, was far from simple at all. Um, the whole thing started in 2015. Uh, we did this, we ran um, really comprehensive statewide research to assess some needs regarding faculty members' you know, use of OER and their perception and needs. And from that uh, research, 
uh, it, it was discovered that uh, despite numerous uh, faculty members, thousands of faculty members who actually adopted OER, um, it still remained as a random and very elusive opportunity for our for many students. So you really have to be very lucky to accidentally sign up for the courses that happen to be taught with OER. So some students are super lucky; they uh, they get they benefit from OER quarter after quarter, and some students ne would never hear about it until they graduate. So we saw that as an equity issue, and we crafted this. Uh, statewide policy that would require colleges to label the courses that use OER. And for that, we ran two rounds of statewide surveys, inviting all of the faculty members and college administrators to provide an input um, on the policy guideline on every item there um, to the level that they actually wordsmith the every word. Mm -hmm. And from that process, we were able to establish the policy guideline and managed to legislate that into the state law in 2017. So from that place, we ran a, a pilot with three colleges in our system. And from those three colleges, we got this very consistent feedback saying, boy, we need another label that would label the courses that use other affordable course materials that do not necessarily fit into the definition of OER such as really inexpensive commercial textbooks. So we got to that work and then soon faced this gigantic challenge, which was setting up the threshold, like how low is the low enough for the whole colleges. So uh, we turned to our students and our student uh, association raised, you know, they, um, they took the challenge and uh, ran a statewide survey on students and their recommendation on the threshold, and we managed to receive 10,050 responses in just two months. So from that recommendation, we ran another round of statewide surveys, inviting again faculty members and college administrators to worse meet the policy guideline, this time, this time for the low cost label. So through that five rounds of statewide surveys, we were able to establish the um, policy guidelines for both low cost and OER labels, and they got legislated in, two th in 2020. So to come to that point, it took about five years. And then uh, for the past three years, we've been busy implementing, and um, we are at the 80% of statewide implementation, meaning that 80% of our 34 colleges are actively implementing OER and low cost labeling policies, benefiting our students, and they get to make informed choices at the time of registration. So that's where we are. So in this process, what I really wanted to highlight was our student involvement. Um, Washington Community and Technical College Student Association, known as WAXA, took charge and they were in charge of promotion and distribution of surveys. And that was actually a bit of understatement. Um, what they did was in the months of October and November, really cold in uh, Washington, and they were holding iPad and sometimes with a little piece of candy and they will go everywhere, like cafeteria, student lounge, classroom, or sometimes even outside asking and urging their fellow students to uh, fill out the survey. and. From that mad effort, we reached about 5,000 responses. But then from there, um, it was so moving and a lot of our system college offices were motivated and they voluntarily connected with student organization body of their campus and rallied to promote this policy and managed to increase the total number into 10,050. So <laughs> we were, um, they, after that, they even lobbied. Um, uh, they did, they put a lot of lobbying efforts with Washington State uh, representatives, senators. They would voluntarily ask for less later luncheon or breakfast to talk about this policy so that when it comes to the uh, legislative session, they will get that our bill will get the support. And students would come to the hearing testifying. And it just, <laughs> the, um, is so the, uh, while I was preparing for this uh, presentation, there were a few moments that I got like welled up, remembering that moment, how it was. And I just wanted to share this. Um, the, uh, actually, this photo was taken from another student event. I, 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 I couldn't find the top photos that we took, but it was similar to this. <laughs> so um, 
I, I remember asking this question, uh, the, having this conversation with one of the represent student representatives who worked with me during that time, and I said, hey, just so you know, um, this policy will not have any impact on you guys. Uh, it will take at least a couple of years for this policy to be in place um, and uh, be in full operation. So sorry. And then she said, well, we are fully aware of it. <laughs> and then she said, we are in community colleges. We will graduate in a, in a year or two. Uh, so we know that we will not benefit from this policy. We are doing this for the uh, for this. We are advocating for this change for the future students. Oh, so, so um, that the sense of conviction I had that day still remains in me, and um, that they have been the biggest teacher for me. And this award is really for them. And um, so, along with all that uh, data-driven process and student leadership. We also put a lot of dedicated um, effort for the effective implementation strategies. We put a really comprehensive labeling guideline that has, that not only offers you definition and criteria, but all of the sample cases, what's qualified, what's not qualified, 10 different um, case studies, and we put all of them there, making sure it's as comprehensive as it can be. And we also put a lot of professional development training, tutorial, sample cases, best practices, this video and that video, uh, the tools, the all types of tools, making sure that our fac when our faculty members are ready to jump in, they have enough guide. And we built a um, very dedicated coordinator net coordinators network, and we do meet monthly, sharing concerns, experiences, and um, last item, we do have monitoring agency. Uh, Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges, a state government agency that support our systems, uh, 34 two-year colleges, my agency. Uh, we work as an active monitoring agency that coordinate the entire statewide operation. We collect and share usage data as well. So speaking of usage, usage data, I just pulled, before I came here, ask our data service people to pull the data on the total number of class sections and total enrollment, enrollment in those class sections and based on that data, we, it was estimated that in just two years, total amount of student cost saving is over $20 million. And I'm so happy to report that number. And I think that based on that number, I can humbly feel that um, our efforts have paid off. So this is where we are heading. Looking ahead, uh, we are aiming 100% participation across all 34 colleges by 2025. Um, we are also looking into integration of labeling data with student achievement data so that we can have more holistic picture about the total impact of this policy on students' achievement and their career path. And, um, you know, so this is our very genuine and sincere effort to align the practice with policy, a policy with practice. So bringing the, some, of some fancy words in the policy document into a reality was beyond challenging, but uh, with data-driven process, inviting stakeholders from the beginning, and um, the dedicated professional development uh, services, and uh, an active involvement of our students, I think that we have our policy um, evolved into a usable and friendly guidelines for the daily operations. So I, I would say that our policy, we have our policy implemented. Thank you. Thank you for this honor. Very impressive. I'm sure many know it can be difficult to do this in a single institution. To do it across 34? Yeah. Okay. Now we have... I have, to admit, I have a personal favorite about this one because uh, I've watched this. Uh, the We Like Sharing competition has been part of Open Education Week for a couple times, and I like pictures. And really want to proud that uh, this one in the wild card category, we decided to create it an open one because we have a lot of categories, but there's always things that maybe don't fit. So Bea de los Arcos from TU Delft is here to talk about We Like Sharing. This is really a lot of fun, guys. Um, so thank you, thank you, OI Global. Thank you um, 
to the whole of the community, and thank you also for the opportunity to actually show you, because I am, it's, it's not me, guys, the, I'm, I'm here, but it's the work like of lots of different people and um, who just wanted to share a photograph. So, um, oops, okay, there you go. So I live in the Netherlands. I'm originally from Spain, but I live in the Netherlands. And in the country where everybody owns at least three bicycles, <laughs> I'm a walker. <laughs> so when I walk, I have, you know, you walk and you have ideas. And this is during one of my pandemic walks. I had the, the very simple idea of opening a Flickr account, initially with the idea of sharing some of the photographs that our course teams use in their MOOCs, in their courses, in their online courses. So that just another way of facilitating reuse. But since you have a Flickr account and you're, you know, why do not just keep sharing and invite other people to, um, to share photographs? These days we all go around with, with phones in our pockets and you know, it's just very easy, very, very easy to take a, um, a photograph. So, um, that was February 2021. Uh, Open Education Week was around the corner because it's, it's March. So I said, that's perfect. Why don't I use, so let's put the two things together so I can organize a photo competition to raise awareness about the, the photo bank, which is called We Like Sharing, by, by the way. Um, and at the same time, celebrate Open Education Week. Um, and it was very, very, very simple, honestly. The whole idea is that um, I invited people, well, I asked Willem for 100 euro, so that's all we needed, so that was to fund the, to fund the award. <laughs> but then I invited pretty much everyone, and with help of um, different colleagues, we started making as much no noise as possible. And the, the premise is very, very simple. We just invited people to submit a photograph where they would represent what open means to them. And, um, and that was it, really. The thing is that they, they could um, submit any file, any kind of photograph with a fancy camera, with a phone, with anything. Um, the only request, let's put it that way, was that they, so they would always retain the copyright, so this has nothing to do with the university, the author of the photograph would retain the copyright, but they would, they would need to choose a Creative Commons license because these photographs were going to be shared. Yeah, in in, uh, they were going to be shared with the whole world. So, uh, so, so, that's, so that's what I did. Um, and photographs started coming in. So we did it first in February, sorry, March 21. We repeated it in, in March 22. We did it this year. This year was the biggest. Um, I normally, uh, with the help of Alan, and so I know I try to organize an international jury just to make it, you know, make it just an international jury that it's gonna be. But this year we also introduced the category of um, the people's choice, so that everyone and anyone and everyone could actually could actually vote for their favorite. So then the photo with the most votes would would be awarded the people's choice. Uh, so it is a lot of fun. Um, at the moment we have something like just over 1,000 photographs in there, all released under a CC license, all tagged, all, um, you know, with the attribution text, just to make it really easy to people to learn how to attribute correctly. And the description of the, each of the photographs also serves as um, if anyone is using these photographs in, in an online course, for example, and want to do the right thing and add the alt description, the description is already there. So it's just a matter of copy and paste. So as I said, it's super fun. There are lo lots of, so I'm showing you, this, these are the winners of the, of the uh, yeah, I think it was between this year's competition and last year's competition. But there are all kinds of photographs in there. So I'm always thinking that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So some of these photos are super beautiful, you might think, but they are actually other super beautiful photographs that are normal photographs. But something that you would be very easy 
um, you know, it's actually very easy to reuse because you will need some of those photographs. In fact, the presentation I'm giving tomorrow, all the photographs I'm, I'm, I'm using in my presentation come from, from, the, from the repository. So yeah, so that, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Bea. And, and one of the great things, I mean, this is pretty simple, but it's so replicable and easy to do. So, And, and all you need is 100 euros, right? <laughs> um, we do want to recognize that we have uh, five awards represented here. There's another 11, and we've collected a series of video messages from other award winners after their um, they got word of their award, and you can even learn more about them um, in their own voice as well as obviously on the awards website. So uh, we want to thank everybody for coming here. We're going to have some room for comments, and I also want to invite my colleague Marcel Morales, our interim director, uh, to come up and say a few words. Just very briefly, I want to say uh, congratulations to our winners. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Paul, Michelle. Uh, Bea, Bouillon, and Julia. It's a pleasure to learn a little bit more about your projects and initiatives, and thank you for being here. And congratulations also to all our winners that are not with us here. Uh, just be sure that we're celebrating your win and your projects and initiatives. And also, I just want to say that the awards for us is really just a way to recognize and celebrate the amazing work that the community does. And it's really the awards are of the people for the people is the way that we like to look at it because uh, the reviewing committee is part of our community. The projects that are being reviewed are part of the community. It's just a way to celebrate the amazing work that we do together as a community. So congratulations. And thank you, thank you very much for sharing a little bit more about your projects. You. So we are open for questions and comments. And I want to say thank you also to my colleague, Alan, for leading us through this process of the awards so brilliantly this year. Um, so anybody, questions, comments, ideas? Okay, so lastly, I want to say thank you also to the nominators. And I want to encourage everybody to be part of the awards. There's no way for us to know and learn about the projects other than the ones that we receive. So we always encourage the community itself to share with us the projects so we can learn about them and then have these beautiful panels and learn more about the open initiatives that are happening around the world. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful session. It's always amazing to learn a little bit about all the projects that are happening around the world. So thank you very much for being with us.